Other shows may talk football, but we grab it by the balls. Have a look at what's in tonight's lineup. Yes, but I, my personal opinion is that <coughs> the game should be refereed by men. We play the same way most times, so it's a maintenance job. I expected everyone to come in in the morning smiling, laughing, because there's nothing better. He's either got to hang his boots up, or he's got to a tumble pie, and he's got to go to a lower division club yeah. as a player manager. I think match days when you can't do anything about it, you know, you're sitting in the dugout and it's... Uh, it, it was always worse, I think, sitting in the dugout than actually playing. Manchester City have fallen on hard times. Big topics over the last few weeks have been referees for one and World Cups for another, with England doing so well qualifying. We're in uh, good company here tonight. We've got Philip Don, ex um, referee. He's uh, also done the World Cup in um, States, America. Yeah. We've got Gary Shaw, ex England and Aston Villa. Robbie Savage, ex pin up Leicester <laughs> City. <laughs> what do you mean and next? Wales. What do you mean next? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, Ex-footballer Gary Bennett <laughs> <laughs> and, Tony, and Tony Bennett look alike. <laughs> but getting, getting, on, getting on to the World Cup, England doing so well, Gary. Yeah. Got to have been there, right? Yeah, I'd love to, love to have had the opportunity of playing the World Cup. I mean, I, I missed out just in 82, um, very close in 82 when I was uh, very young. But uh, it must be a fantastic opportunity for the guys who are going to go there. And I'm sure they'll all be... You know, fighting desperately to to t retain the form, uh, and the outsiders to try and get in the squad. You know, fantastic. And being so close as well, be very well supported, no doubt. And Rob, well, Wales, Vinnie, we haven't qualified for World Cup now for it's 1952, I don't think. That likes to spark you, um, Dean Saunders. Well, that is a problem. Everyone says, isn't it? Wales have got the players. Yeah, well, they had them, but they're getting rid of them. Speak for yourself, yeah. Wouldn't have got the likes of him taking over me, sure. What the hell have I got? What do you think? Do you think he's good enough to take over me? No, but when they say that, obviously, Benham. You must have been close to a Welsh cat, though, with a name like you. Benham, you know, I mean. Jamaica, Jamaica. We're going there with Jamaica, so what can I say? We're better than Wales, ain't we? This time was fashion. It's not fashion. It's a Welsh name, isn't it? When England were doing well, Fash was the big. England man, and then Nigeria and then yeah, like, oh, <laughs> yeah they chose it. And he's West Indies when the cricket comes round, well, isn't Obviously. They? I'm Australian when the rugby comes round. <laughs> <laughs> what about what about Wales? What about Wales with the players they've got? It's a pity because they've got top class players and it's a pity they can't get to the World Cup. They've missed out a few times. But these things do happen. And it's like you say, you've got the Sparky, Rushy. Yourself, well, you say what? yourself. So. <laughs> Is that no but it's, it's, it, it's a pity, and like you say, you've got other countries now are catching you up and taking you over. Uh, like you say, us, Jamaica, us, you noticed, and you've got Nigeria and other countries like that have, have come, up, come up to you and passing you I and going to the World Cup. Some more like the Wales now, aren't they, then? <laughs> I don't know. I think, I mean, well, I'm not getting to it anyway. <laughs> Somebody has been to a World Cup, Philip. What is it like? Well, it was fantastic. I, I spent a week at Easter in Dallas where we were training and we had the course. And it wasn't until the end of that week that I knew I was actually going back because they took 30 referees and only 24 were going to be invited for the well, it was World all the, Cup. It, it was a big test sort of thing, It was, was it? tests. You had f uh, f two fitness tests, you had a full medical, you went through the laws of the game and then at the end of the tour, at the end of that week we were told we'd know within two days. It was literally a fortnight later when I got a letter saying I, I was going. When I went to Dallas on 12th of June, we were based in Dallas for the five weeks, and it, w it was a fantastic experience. But again, referees were, were put under a lot of pressure. Every day we had seminars, uh, and you looked at the videos of the previous day's games, and if a referee hadn't cautioned or hadn't sent off, then he, he was told about it. And on a couple of occasions, they actually said to referees, in your first game, you cautioned six, you issued one red card, why only three yellows in your second? we want more cards, we want more penalties. And the reason they did the penalty one was because in the qualifying competition, they analysed every game and the referees only awarded one penalty in every three games. And they, we were told that there must be more penal offences committed and therefore they wanted more goals, they wanted more penalties. Why is that though? Why is that pressure? Well, because we felt we were under pressure, because if we hadn't performed how FIFA wanted, we'd have been sent home. Because halfway through the tournament, they cut the list from 24 uh, referees to nine referees. 
unfortunately I stayed on and I refereed a quarter final. What are you but trying you, to but say? You, but, you, but you must be going against your beliefs, really, Philip, in a way, because, I mean, surely a, a referee, a good referee, from the player's point of view, is one that's like not noticed and one yeah, that's just, that's right. you know, doesn't have to make rash decisions in that's any it. way. I mean, that's what the players say, yeah. you know, what a, a good, good game the referee. It's always yeah. judged on, yeah. he hasn't, you know, he's not been, he's not, yeah. he's not been over the top with his decision yeah. making. I think the point you make there is probably down to the fact that being held in America, you know, it had to be seen to be a big, you know, uh, a big spectacle. And Decisions had to be made, yeah. and, and you can't just go through a game without something, yeah. you know, irrational happening. I think whether it be from a player or from a referee. Yeah. There's that point about FIFA wanted it to be the biggest spectacle in the world, and they think France will be even bigger <laughs> than the States. The other point is, you've got because it is a World Cup, you've got referees from countries like Mauritius, Australia, Japan. The guy from Mauritius had never refereed in front of more than 3,000, and he did the States and Russia. He did when we were there. When they saw Ben Hope before, they all left. But he was then, he then refereed in front of 74,000. So you can imagine, he, he had difficulty in coping with that pressure. And, and he actually only ended up refereeing the one game. Yeah, but a penalty is a penalty. So it is. If, if they have a go at you saying that you're not giving enough penalties, who's right or wrong here? If you're not doing, well, the, giving the, the right the decisions. Say, what? say on a Saturday now, Phil. If if say someone goes over and and you think he's dived. Yeah. If you think that out there, then you're saying you'd have to get the pen. No. If, if if I thought he died, I'd caution him because we were told also we had to caution players who feigned injury or tried to get other players cautioned or sent off. I can't understand me. FIFA saying you should be given more penalties yeah. or things like that. They must think that you're not the decision is wrong, what you're making. They, they, they were saying that in the qualifying competition only one penalty was given in every three games. They're saying, come on chaps, there must be more penalty offences and you're turning a blind eye to That's it. That's Americans though, isn't it? They want action, they want goals, don't they? They, they want, need, I mean, yeah, shoot out and everything. It. But the, the about it was to do with the entertainment. What about, what, what about yeah. your role? I know obviously getting there and, and, and getting picked I mean, is the same as us getting yeah, picked that's right, planet. that's right what are, the, what are um, the, other, the other benefits like the money and all that I mean did you end up because um, uh, the referee for um, the Holyfield Tyson fight yeah 10, 10 grand he got is it 10 grand he got right. 10 grand yeah, yeah. Well, if I tell you that for the five, the week at Easter when I was in America and the five weeks I was off school in June and July, I had to take unpaid leave from school. So I didn't... I have got some new suits. Yeah, but I'm, from my job as a head teacher, I actually had to take unpaid leave. Any time I went abroad, I lost out. What, they don't pay you? They, you, get a, you get a daily allowance when you go abroad, you don't get a match fee. And well, we're just, we're just, come back in a minute. We're just going to have a whip round for Philip. <laughs> we'll see you back in a minute. Well, back to Tony Brown. Cantelo is involved. Cantelo's cross and a good save by Bailey. Owen, firm and positive. Cantelo's protestations of no avail. Cantelo. Cantelo again doing very well. He's got the corner. Len Cantelo, ex-West Bromwich Albion and Brian Robson's mentor. Brian Robson's been quoted many times as saying you were his mentor. Was that quite a proud thing for him to say about you? you yes, I mean, I feel proud. Um, he was a youngster coming to West Bromwich Albion when I was, say, established in the first team. Um, and I could see potential there from, from day one. And he just grew from there, you know, physically, mentally, and he was, you know, it turned out to be, everybody, everybody knows what kind of player he was. Why, and, why were you uncapped? I don't know, I mean, it's... Um, I mean, obviously you'd been recognised, if people yeah, I mean, remember I got every, I got every other cap there was, I mean, schoolboy, youth level, under 23 level, but I didn't get the one really that, that counted. Was that, was that disappointing? Definitely, definitely, yeah. I mean, that's... That's the one you everybody will remember. Yeah. Nobody remembers a schoolboy cap or under 23 caps. It's got to be the full international. So yeah, disappointing. Yeah. Are you still working in, in football at the moment? I do have my own soccer schools in North Manchester, um, which I run um, on an annual basis. 
um, and I really enjoy it. You know, the kids are fantastic. Mm. And it's, I, that's, I get my buzz now from seeing, you know, I, they start as young as five and it's fantastic to see them running around. Okay. And hopefully, maybe, you know, <laughs> there might be a future star there. Have you seen any sort of potential stars there? Well, you do, you, obviously, but they change from year to year. You know, kids at eight, you see potential and then maybe at 12 it's the, the interest has gone a little bit. Yeah. Do you think, is difficult. it difficult to sort of keep them motivated and committed to that at that it's age? Not at, a, not at a young age. I think from five onwards with all the, 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 the TV and the interest in the Premiership and the star quality and everything else that goes with it. At that age, youngsters are, are not a problem. I think it's when they reach to say 14, mm -hmm. 15 and they, fa they start finding other interests then that's where it's Girls. difficult. <laughs> Correct. So that and whatever else. So that's difficult. Yeah. Have you ever wanted to be involved in management? Not one iota. No. I had a little a little spell at Stockport County when Acer Hartford was manager. I was assistant manager. Um, and I could definitely say it was not my cup of tea. Um, what I, was it that turned you off that? Um, a little bit of disappointment really. I think uh, I found with no disrespect to the, the level of football, I didn't find uh, the players' uh, dedication, interest at, at that lower level to the way I wanted it to be. I, I expected everybody to come in in the morning smiling, laughing, because there's nothing better than turning up in, a, in the morning, a lovely day, to train and play and do something that you really enjoy. And I found it a little bit disappointing that players didn't have that attitude. So, uh, you know, and I couldn't. Maybe that is a good manager, a good coach to get that out. Maybe that, I, I didn't have that, but um, I, no, I didn't really enjoy the, that, that time. He just wanted one chipped in. Now it's played in low for him. Back heel for Cantelo. What a magnificent goal! What a great goal! Moss, ex Luton Town player and recently departed Huddersfield Town manager. David, you made the transition from a player to a manager yourself. Why did you do that? Um, I think it was, a, it was a natural step, wasn't it, from, from playing. It's all I've ever done play football and then go into coaching and uh, management. I mean, some players have said they, they never want to get into to the, to the management role. Yeah, but uh, I don't know, I just it just gets in the blood and that's all I've done and that's all I want to do. Yeah. And how difficult is it being a manager from a player? Um, I've not actually managed it. I've, I've coached and I've been an assistant manager, but I've not managed. Um, it's different, you, you need to adjust because uh, you're no longer one of the boys, you know, you've got to be partly one of the boys then you've got to be above it a little bit so it's um, you've got to adjust to it and it takes a bit of time. What's the worst thing about it? Um, I think match days when you can't do anything about it you know you're sitting in the dugout and it's uh, it, it was always worse I think sitting in the dugout than, than actually playing you know when, when when my manager used to scream and shout at me when I was playing I used to think you know what's what's the problem well, you know you're in control on the pitch a little bit but off the field there's nothing you can do about it you're just tearing your hair out for 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's the worst part. Do you see the role as a manager differently now from when you were a player? I think so, yes. I mean, you do, you've, you've got to adjust. I mean, when, you, when you're a player, you think you know everything anyway. You know, you, your manager criticises you or criticises something you've done and uh, you always know best, don't you? But uh, when you're on the other side, I think, I think you learn more. I'm a better player now than I was when I played, basically because I know the game more. But unfortunately, the legs don't go quick enough. <laughs> I mean, I love coaching. It's it's the next best thing, basically. I love being out on the football field. I love working with the players. But the best thing is playing.
evening, I'm Mary Parkinson, and this evening I'm with a real mixed bag of Midlands fans. We've got Leicester Wolves, Birmingham and Villa here. Gavin, you are the Aston Villa mascot. What possesses a grown man to put on a silly suit <laughs> and do what you do? The banter, the... Aston just, <laughs> just being part of the club, it's, it's part of being the club, and I, and I just love mucking around, going out there, especially like Leeds this season when you guys are out there who spat on me. You know, it's, it's a bit of banter, going back to like, not the trouble scenes, like the 70s, I loved it. And when you when I walk back off and the away fans are giving me a bridge, yeah, it's, it's calmed down. It's on the edge feeling. Yeah, it is, yeah. It's, it's, it's going to the pub before the game, having a, a couple of tots and going out there and just being out on the pitch and, you know what I mean? I mean, you get on the pitch more than we do, <laughs> let's face it. The well, the last time I got on the pitch at Villa Park, they actually did tell me off. Today. I had two shots on goal, missed them, and then the third one actually went in. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it was a cool game. Well, yeah, I mean, no offence, Stan. Uh, I mean, what Sav said so about you in the press this week. But uh, no, I mean, it, it's just been part of Aston Villa. So yeah. it's, it's in my you, Are you a lifelong Villa fan? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And what about you, Janice? Have you been a, a lifelong Birmingham fan? Absolutely, born in Birmingham. Obviously, we carry the city's name, which is more than you'll ever do. <laughs> well, uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I think it's fair to say, like for each of us here, we'd much rather watch like five minutes of our own team than five hours of anybody else. Like, well, Manchester yeah. United, Liverpool, probably playing the best football. Yeah, but it's around. Not the same. It doesn't but matter, it does doesn't, it? Your heart's here, you have to watch your own team. And I personally would rather watch two minutes of Birmingham than five hours of Manchester United versus Liverpool. I mean, the, 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 okay, wait, there are I disagree there because I'd rather watch class football uh, being a Premiership <laughs> side. Uh, but uh, even so, it would be nice to see like Villa get a, a few more, like, you know. Uh, we talk, we talk passion. Classics we talk a, passion. A, 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 a Let's talk about the Geordies. Let's talk about the Geordies being the most passionate supporters in the country. Newcastle United, they said they're the most passionate. Desperately overrated. Right? Desperately yeah. overrated. You, you go to Manchester, they say Manchester, Manchester United, best supporters in the league. You go down to, Lo you go down, you go down to London, you go down to London, now talk about this. In the Midlands, we've got as much passion as anybody. Yeah. Right? We feel everything for our clubs. Yeah, right? clubs I, I would die for, I would die for Wolverhampton Wanderers. Right? I respect everybody else's opinion around it. Table. The, the, but as far as I'm concerned, there is only one team in the Midlands, there's only one team I want to watch, and that is Wolverhampton Wanderers. Right? But having said that, I would rather see West Brom, Villa, Birmingham, and Leicester doing well than seeing Man United, Liverpool, Arsenal, anybody else. I mean, we're the Crash yes, yeah. community and we stick yeah. together. The Midlands boys, right? There's no we, we can match anybody. No we can match anybody in yeah. the country. Yeah. Well, at the moment, that that is debatable, but you know, I mean, Villa, you, I mean, you, you struggled this season to get going, haven't you? Definitely. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I think at the moment, the the since last season, the the, the eight fit's still there. We have bought and. It hasn't gelled yet, has it? No, it, it hasn't. Just hasn't no, gelled it yet. just hasn't. I mean, the defence. If you look at the defence, the defence is still solid. We're looking through goals. Over. It's still the same players. I don't know if Brian Little, if you're out there, Brian, what you've done with buying Stan Collymore and playing this like three forward role. I don't think it's worked. And more players. It's hard what to you're, play a three you're, forwards with a five-man Ma defence. Yes, yes, as a Wolverhampton yes. Wanderers supporter, if yeah. Villa want to offload Stan Collymore, we'll take Stan tomorrow. Stan, you're a Wolves <laughs> fan. I'm a Wolves <laughs> fan. I want to see Dan the Molyneux, Stan. Excuse me, he comes from Cannon. He does, yes, and but he supports he Wolves. He's a, he's a Villa fan. Stan, get on this programme and tell him who you support, do you Stan. Want, do you want Stan? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not, no. <laughs> what about Leicester? Definitely not. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's most overrated. Steve well, Bruce has gone all these down, as I said. Um, <laughs> yes, he has this season. He absolutely. absolutely. He has. He probably gets paid a little bit more money, but uh, um, yeah, at 37 years old, if he can do the business, he's like. Is he 37 now, Bruce? Absolutely. Well, I mean, he was a fantastic servant for Manchester United. Bruce, Bruce, Bruce Forsyth. <laughs> 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 Bruce, I think he was a fine boy for uh, Blues. Yeah, Good experience, like a bit of a Paul McGuff. It is, you see, you see the players when they, they go past the peak in the Premiership and they can, they can drop down. I mean, you see someone like Ian Rush who is still really struggling now yeah. in in the top flight. And players like Brucey. Ian Rush, he either ought to hang Paul his McGuff. boots up now. No, Ian, yeah, Bruce, Ian Rush, right? He's either got to hang his boots 
picks up or he's got a it's humble pie and he's got to go to a lower division club yeah. as a player manager yeah. Ian Rush was one of the best strikers I mean, this country's ever Aldridge. seen no, Ian Rush was one of the best strikers this country's yeah. ever seen Absolutely. and if he steps down now as John Aldridge has done with Tranmere ok yeah. he's not making so many appearances now Rushy would be a great striker in the lower divisions yeah. do yourself a favour Ian come down the Wolves get us in the Premier <laughs> you and Stan Collymore Steve Ball were there have you got room for him too my god <laughs> <laughs> what about Stan Collymore at Villa? You know, you're paying the wages of that. I'd far sooner see Steve Claridge at Leicester for the wages we're paying him to what you're paying at Collymore because I think yeah. he's most overrated. Do you think Claridge is going to stay? I, I mean, think he will. Uh, yeah, because yeah, Steve he's Claridge a just he's a cult Leicester hero. because nobody he's else will buy him. I mean, he's oh, an no, extraordinary man, Claridge. isn't he? <laughs> he's a madman, isn't he? He's yeah, but what, he, what he's done for Leicester, I mean, don't tell me wrong, and I've got to say this in front of the camera. When we saw him, I said, what the hell we're buying him for? Uh, but I've been proved wrong. That oh. man... It, I love when Steve Claridge, which you never sold him to. When he pulls that shirt on, he will run, he will hold the ball up. You know, and I think we've been missing him over the last two or three matches. And now he's come back, proved it. Yeah. On Monday, he held the ball up. We want somebody to stand there and say, I'll hold it, you come and take it, you've won a score. You're talking about players that clubs need. One player that's recently left the Midlands club, they're not represented around this table, West Bromwich Albion, Paul Pesca Salido has just gone to Fulham. Yeah. Uh, my mate Bob, my, good, yeah, my mate good, Bob is an Albion supporter and I've said to him, the player we need down the Wolves to give us a bit of you know, a bit of movement up front is Paul Pesca Salido. Yeah. We've missed out on him now, he's gone chasing the money down in London. Right? But Paul Pesca Salido is far, far too good a player oh, to be playing for Fulham. In the second yeah. division. Yeah, definitely. It's a complete waste of time. And there was talk of Leicester making a bit And, and us, yeah. Why did Birmingham sell him? Uh, probably because he married Karen Brady and there's a bit of <laughs> stick inside <laughs> the dressing room. <laughs> and we're not going to go into that one. But he had, <laughs> he's a nice hockey man, Canadian, and he only asked for a puck. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, we're going to wrap up this. <laughs> After the break, Craig Brown talks about the Scotland's hopes for France 98. Mary Parkinson is in the Midlands, Finney Jones is supping beer down the pub with his mates and we look at Main Road in the 80s. Shell. I've seen uh, Tony and uh, Malcolm about an hour and a half ago. Uh, we talked about the club's position and I put it to them, asked them to, if they'd like to, uh, I don't think likes the word, but if they'd resign from the position of manager and coach. And that's what they've done. All right, just a quick well, John Bond's been offered the position of uh, manager of Manchester City, which seems Exactly. The only problem with slight problem we've got, which I'll be dealing with after we finish here, is the question of compensation with his club. This is the story of two men who were teammates in the 50s. On the left, Malcolm Allison, the teacher. On the right, John Bond, his pupil. Thirty years later, their paths cross again at a famous football club. Manchester City have fallen on hard times. They haven't won a league game all season. In two years, over eight million pounds worth of players have come and gone, and now they're third from the bottom of the first division. City fans are tired of being overshadowed by their more glamorous rivals, United. They want success, and in the 60s, Malcolm Allison provided it. So it's just the first division movement now, just about a yard. He coached an exciting City team to four major triumphs in five years. One, that way, two this way. Now Big Mal's back. He's sold seven internationals and put his faith in the talents of these raw youngsters. Manchester City's chairman is Peter Swales. He's backed Malcolm for 18 months. A week ago, he was asked whether Alisson was one minute from the sack. He didn't say no. Now I want you to get Alan right from the off. Right. 
Welcome back. I'm Mary Parkinson and we are talking the Midlands today. And all four of us want to talk about, well, the five of us actually, want to talk about referees. That's right, I mean, I believe you've got something quite interesting to say. Yeah. The referee just moved up to the Premier Division, Uriah Rennie. As far as I'm aware, he's the only black referee that's refereeing at top flight football. And I would say Uriah Rennie, if you're watching Uriah, you're the best referee I have seen in the Football League or the Premier Division for a long, long time. You deserve to do well. I mean, we play Port Vale two seasons ago. We got four black players in our sides. And the, as the talk is on the terraces, we'll be OK here. We got four black players and a black referee out there. What did he do? Mark Rankin sent him off, right? Indiscretion, he deserved to go, he went. Yeah. Straight away, no racism in football. They said, let's kick racism out of football. We've got a black referee there doing a very good job, taking no preference. Uriah Rennie, best referee in the league. I mean, look. Yeah, we're getting now, but let's, let's go down over the whole system of the, the Premiership First Division. Standard of refereeing is way down. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's no consistency. Do you think that refereeing has, the standard of refereeing has dropped, or do you think that just the demands that are being made on referees are great now? I mean, I think it's a combination of the two. I think the standard has dropped. The standard think, has definitely dropped. The, the standard has dropped, and uh, just going up beside the point, we're still on football now. Uh, Sunday League football, the standard has gone like the referees on Sunday League football, which I play, yeah. has gone higher. Right. They think they are well, bloody the fat. Yeah. yeah. I know I'm, I'm talking behind the point now, but uh, no, I mean. So they think they're FIFA I, officials. I, I, I re yeah. I mean Sunday League football. It's going crazy at the moment. I watch some like uh, on, on Skylight, some uh, Premiership games, and, and uh, it's absolutely unbelievable. They've gone down. That's what we need to bring into the full set. Go, go back. You're saying as the standards drop. Go back to Clive the Book Thomas, right? Clive yeah. Thomas. Everybody yeah. knows Clive yeah. Thomas. Yeah. You knew where you stood with him. Strong referee. Whether he was right, whether he was wrong, he stood there and he, he, he stood there to be counted. Yeah. Some of these referees here, I mean, Clive Thomas was never persuaded by the crowd to go one way or the other. He was his own he man and whether he was right, whether he was wrong, he stuck by it. Now some of these referees, their do decisions are being swayed. swayed by the crowd? I do, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because we had this when we played Athens Cribs in Madrid. When we were over there. And they said that uh, we would get a better deal from the referee when we come over to Leicester. But we didn't, we had a far, far worse ref, yeah, and at the moment he's suspended, he will not ref another, another game. That's right, he, uh, he has yeah, it's finished. You, I mean, you take some referees like the, the Dutchman who refereed the England-Italy game was fantastic. He performed very, very well, I mean, yeah. he really did perform well. I mean, he, I mean that, if we're talking about intimidating atmospheres, that must have been one of the most hostile atmospheres to referee in ever, and he was not swayed by the Italians at yeah, all, what, was he? What we say is, not every, not every referee is bad, and not every referee is good, but the standard of refereeing as a whole what do you has see dropped. As the solution then? What do you see? Full time, time referees. Oh, referees. I think it's got to be said that they should be paid full time. Have professional referees. It's so inconsistent. It's unbelievable. You have good refs. You have bad refs. Yeah, I think. You have I mean, to I think what everybody wants is a level of consistency. Absolutely. Isn't it? I mean, the demands on referees are colossal today. They have to be fitter. The game is so much faster than it was Mary, 20 can I, years can I ago. Say, I think that's why we need yeah. professional referees. Yeah, yeah. Of, to yeah. keep up with yeah. the demands. Yeah. There was a point. So there was a point made here. There was a point made in the first half, Mary. We've got two Premier Team supporters here and we've got two First Division teams. Yeah. The referees in the Premier Division are paid a retainer and £350 a game. Yeah. Yeah. The referees in the Nationwide League are paid £180 a game, yeah. right? That's, that's just above half of what the Premiers are. Yeah. Now, are they saying an Aston Villa game or a Leicester game is more important to the players, the teams and the supporters no, 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 than no, a no, Birmingham City? No, you're You're not saying that, but are, no, are no. the people who pay the money saying that? Oh, yeah, yeah, on, on I mean, cross, that's what we're that's saying. What saying. Are yeah. the people who are paying the money saying, saying that, that Premier that Division is same. more important than the Nationwide League? If it's not, then pay them the same, get them full-time contracts, and let's pay them 30, 40 grand a year or whatever they need, rather than having to go out, you know, shoe shine boys or whatever they do in the daytime, and try and come out and do a referee's job on the day. My, my, my solution, my solution, Mary, right, is, is to get cameras involved in the game. You think so? Yeah, yeah if you watch the Sky game, I mean, Andy Gray, he's got it. Touch the ball, like and you can see, you can see. Like rugby league, that limited. Yeah. Yeah. It would have last second. Home and if it's only a phone call from a second official down the line, that was pretty like on side. One at a time, one at a time. If, if it was such a blatant 
referee incident and he wasn't sure, he would look up and a goal was involved, he would look up and it would be there straight down. They could review it and they would say, and it would be cast off. And that would be done in seconds. That would be done in seconds. If you're doing similar to cricket where the indicator the third umpire, where that did the ball cross the line or did he punch him in the face, yeah. fine. But you yeah. can't just keep no, stopping no, the starting. No, no, I mean, no, no, I'm, I'm, no, no, a goal or a penalty decision. No, You've only got to look up at the signs. And listen in your earpiece, yes. Yeah. No, a decision. decision. That's yeah. what we're saying. A decision. Like, we'll go Look, back to the classic game. one. That Not an elbow. It was brought up on Monday, and this is what Arson's saying about uh, Mike Reed, which is a penalty incident at Chelsea. Right? And I agree, for something like that, when it involves, with the last couple of minutes, that it means a Because that cost us mega bucks. Yes. For, for something like that, I think it should be a third eye. Yeah. Yeah. So you would restrict it to within the box for penalty, or did it cross the line? No, even what, 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 I saw a decision where the goal would... would so would, so would, you'd have to, you would, in the 18 yard area, it would have to be, no, wouldn't no, it? No, really, what you've got to decide upon is television going to play such an important role in the game, or isn't it? This, this week, this week yeah. we've, we, we've had the experience of, of three players who have been sent off. Steve Ball, yeah. our star striker, yeah. was sent off in a game. Referee's report said, he grabbed a player around the throat and threw him to the floor. Yeah. That has proved to be totally false, yeah, false. on TV so evidence. It so it's overturned. Dave, Dave Besant against Reading. Yeah, right? overturned. It, but he cost them the game. Yeah. I mean, they, they, yeah. they were 2 0 up at the time. They ended up getting, instead of getting well, we three had points, Gary points as well. Gary Pallister, Pallister, yeah. Pallister, yeah. St. Colin Moore at Bolton. Yeah. And I mean, he was inflicted on and he got Where ran across. Yeah, but he, he punched yeah. him. Yeah. Well, saying that, I mean, <laughs> four players on to one, four players on to one. Well, they both involved Bolton. Bolton are the dirtiest, oh, on, dirtiest team in the Premier League. And then you go out to the ground at Bolton. It's very nice. You've got to start looking up immediately. Yeah, well, where you do you finish? One second. It's where you finish. And I think regarding the likes of us at Toby personally from Chelsea for something like that then I think we need it offside decisions are always going to be iffy because yeah. I mean let's be honest when you've got a camera they're always iffy anyway so we've got to go down to basically the goal scoring yeah no I think we agree on that it's the 18 yard box was it a penalty or was it a goal yeah. and then we leave it at that okay we're going to wrap this one up there thanks very much coming up Billy buys the next round of beers and Jimmy Wag with the King of Scotland, otherwise known as Mr. Craig Brown. We're still on with um, referees, with Philip, we're still on with World Cups with Gary, and with Robbie, and with Benno. We, one thing we've, we've heard about, and obviously they, they probably want to do it, but uh, what about women referees, Philip? Will they come in? Yeah, I was... Well, there's one on the Premier League line at the moment and she referees on the conference. Uh, I mean, my view is that, as in athletics, women are becoming fitter, they're becoming faster because my worry was that women wouldn't be able to keep up with the game. But clearly with uh, techniques and fitness training and so on, now they are certainly more fitter. Uh, I, my own personal opinion is I think the game should be uh, for men should be refereed by men. That is my personal. How would you, opinion. How would you go on? That's yeah. a very being, sexist viewpoint. That's my yeah. personal opinion. How would you go on being told off by a woman? Uh, I'm he's had all his life. He's had all his life. Benno. Quite used to that. Quite used to that. <laughs> No, I think I think there's a room for them. Yeah, I mean you've got uh, we've got official in, involving women at the moment, and I can see a day when when uh, women are going to come in now. Whether how how that's going to affect the players and their concentration levels. Robo, you're struggling. You're struggling when you're wrong. Referees. I think one one ref. One, one was the lane. Fancy me. The ref fancies me. Discrimination, come in though. I mean, the ask for my name, phone number two. See, all clubs now have to have a separate dressing room. For, for, for Wendy Toms, when she's lining at the Football League, Premier League, or refereeing on the conference, she has to have a separate dressing room to what the, the her colleagues. We had one the other day, and I did yeah. wonder. Wendy Toms, yeah. What, on the line? Yeah, she has to have a special, she has oh, a separate look, dressing room. Look, you put the wrong key <laughs> <laughs> so there is that practicality, which I mean, obviously all the clubs can get over. Uh, but I, I, I think at the top level, then all credit to if she can make it, because she's only one step away from the football league list of referees. But I, my personal opinion is that the game should be refereed by men. What I think so, because so, it, it 
if you say certain things in the harsh of the moment, you say swear, you say this and that, how's she going to take it? Because sometimes you're playing there and the decision goes against you and you eat it and you go, oh yeah, and you say referee and what are you going to say, silly this, silly that, no, uh, she, you know what I mean, how's she going to take it? She's very thick skinned, I mean she, she will yes. apply the laws basically as they are written and just as somebody might say, well what did you say, pardon, don't say it and get clear off, she would do exactly the same because she will have built up a rapport with the players. Yeah, but you're all kind of remarks. Do you? Can you build a rapport with players? Yeah, because of her sex, and they get all kinds of remarks. Some she's going to like, and some she's not going to like. She's going to laugh at some, and some she's going to take to heart. The crowd, are, the crowd are going to single her out as well. Aren't they? The crowd are going to be more of a problem than than the players, I think, at that level. Just as when your early days, you must have had the, the problem about your your race, and maybe she's going through the same now with, with her gender. In terms of the comments that are being made, to we don't want to start getting on the women's problems anyway. But. <laughs> what would, what would, would you honestly, if you could turn everything back and have one wish, would it be to be a professional referee? Would you have liked to have been a professional referee? A full-time professional referee, yeah. because the referees who referee at the top level now are professional. Make no bones about it. They give up 20 to 30 hours a week to football, whether it's training, travelling to matches, well, I do that with my dog, but I yeah, don't mean I'm fine. a professional dog walker. But do you want to... Uh, You've got other jobs. You're, yeah. a, you're a headmaster. Fine. Had I have been given the opportunity five, six, every five six years ago... And somebody said to me, you can become a full-time professional referee, I would have jumped at it, had the conditions been right. See, at the moment, referees on the Football League and the Premier League are on a one-year contract. I couldn't afford to give up my job as a head teacher for a one-year contract. You'd have to give me a four- or five-year contract. You'd have to make it worthwhile. Uh, you'd have to look what then happens at the end of that five years. I couldn't then go back into teaching as a head teacher just as uh, Gerald Ashby couldn't go back in as an accountant. You could if it was special and, that, and if they had pensions and things like that. Oh, if they had like pensions, this, life insurance like losing, yeah. plans, everything yeah. else, then say five years ago, I would have jumped at the chance <coughs> because we, was, we were given a, a questionnaire to fill in certain of us by the Football League as it was before the Premier League and the salaries that we were looking at ranged from about twenty to 70,000 a year plus all the perks and everything else and a group of us would have taken it on had we given, been given the opportunity. Yeah. Do, you th do, you, do, you think, do you think sometimes it's all taken too serious? I certainly do at the moment because you... Do you go, what you see, go, what you tell you in that? Uh, yeah, it, you know, the, the, the funny side has gone out of football now. It, I mean, you don't get the characters, do you? The, the, there's a lack of them now. And I say referees, they don't... It just, they, it's difficult to have that rapport with, with referees at the moment, you know, and they're, they're very harsh making decisions. They can't, there's no tackling. What were the good behind. referees in your day, then? Um, well, you go back to... The likes of Jack Taylor, I mean, you know, he, I thought he was an excellent referee. I mean, he had a World Cup final, didn't he, Germany, Holland? Yeah, just shows how, yeah, he was yeah. the one, he was the main man, wasn't he? He was the top right, guy right. at that Clive time. Thomas, he was Clive Thomas, he put referees on the map, really, Clive Thomas, didn't he? Yeah, he but was, did he put them on the map for the right reasons? For the reasons. right reasons. I don't know, Vin, I, I mean, for, for the wrong You've all said here, a good degree. referee, you go to a game, and at the end of it you say, who refereed the game? And that's how it should be. Really, but I think mm. because of the television these days, when you go to a Sky game, you've got at least 15 cameras at any Sky game, and every decision is dissected in slow motion, video replay, and everything. And I think the referees are under a lot of pressure. And I will make the point that if I made as many mistakes in a match as as you make, I'd be off the list at the I'm, end. I've made one in 12 it's, years. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's but if a, you, you analyse players and the number of mistakes, missed time tackles, missed passes that they make in a game, if a referee made as many mistakes as that, he'd be off the list at the end of the I year. He's been transferred so many times. <laughs> <laughs> what, and what about, and what about the, the camera in the sky that they could just... Andy Gray does it quick enough. That's right. Why can't they do it but, and have but, a little headphone? Why, why, but, but what, again, you've got the referee's opinion. I think in terms Opinions of... Opinions aren't enough now with yeah. the money involved. In now terms of fact, you have a camera on the goal line, nobody would disagree with that. Every referee would thank you if you could have a camera on the goal line to see whether the ball goes over the line, because yeah. that's fact. But at the moment, the laws are all about opinion. And if I'm refereeing a game and I, well, I'm not certain, ask the guy in the stand, then you're then transferring the opinion of the referee to the opinion of the guy watching the video. Well, that'd be, that, we could be here forever on that. I'd like Which to, we could. Phil, thanks for coming and being so Thank honest you. with us tonight. 
and uh, and all the lads, Rob, Gal, Benno. I'm in Scotland at the home of the Scottish FA to talk to the man who's guided Scotland to the 1998 World Cup Finals, manager Craig Brown. Fantastic qualification. What were your own personal feelings when that whistle went and you knew you were through? Well, I think uh, my feelings were uh, very pleasing because uh, we've got a terrific support, as you would see, and as everyone knows, so therefore they are expecting us to get and they're hoping that we get there. And when it was finally clinched, you know, we all felt very, very happy, particularly for the fans, also for the players, in particular some of the older players. I'm not going to name the older players, but uh, they feel it's their last chance to get to a World Cup Finals. They were all out to get there and they achieved it and I'm very pleased for them. How long does the moment last though? Because you work and work and work for a moment like that. But it is only a moment and when it's gone, do your thoughts immediately turn to where you go next? That's right, uh, you've hit the nail right on the head because it's a wee bit of an anticlimax. <laughs> you know, you're 14, 15 months playing qualifying games. And when the moment does come, you know, I read somewhere, I think it was Sidney Sheldon, one of the books, when you get there, there is no there. And it's a wee bit like that. There have been times in the past when the Scottish fans have said, we're in the World Cup finals, we'll probably win it now. <laughs> so if you get to the finals next summer with your squad intact, what do you think would represent reasonable success for Scotland? Well, I think uh, a lot depends on the draw. And, uh, you know, I, I feel against most European teams we can cope because we do well defensively. Uh, we don't try to go out and play defensively, but I think we're quite organised in that regard. So if we get the best of Europe, uh, I think we can cope. But the unknown teams... The African nations worry me slightly. Uh, maybe the South Americans, if we get a Brazil or a, an Argentina or Colombia, they present a problem. I'm optimistic that we'll first of all get to the next stage, the last 16, and who knows if we get a favourable draw and we hit form, we could maybe get to the last eight. Will you enjoy it or will you be a bag of nerves? Because some managers look as though every minute is misery. <laughs> Others look as though, yeah, this is fun, better well, than working. Well, I think you look at me, I think this is better than working. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's great. To, and I say to the players as well, this is better than working for them. You know, you're getting paid for getting kept fit, so you enjoy it and enjoy it when you've got the opportunity. And at my age, I certainly do enjoy the big tournaments. And I've been lucky since 1986 to have been involved in quite a number of big uh, European Championship tournaments, World Cup tournaments, both at senior level and with our younger teams. So these are great events and the players will be told, enjoy yourselves because this will be a memory which will last forever. As the Scotland manager, you don't get a day-to-day -day contact that a club manager would have with your players. What sort of problems does that give you? Well, obviously, when they meet, you're, uh, you, you could be starting from scratch, but uh, we've got a system, uh, a playing system, which is fairly standard. And except in exceptional circumstances, we play the same way most times. So it's a maintenance job when they come and we keep as far as possible to the same squad. I don't disturb the squad too much unless we have to. Now, sometimes you've got to react to an injury uh, or you have to be proactive and drop a player or a player or two. Now, I do that if necessary. But when they come, we've got a four or five day preparation period. Now in our case, it's uh, mainly a topping up of uh, maybe some new set pieces, but it's a maintenance programme. They know what we're, they know our uh, objectives, they know our team strategy. Uh, we've got to look at the opposition, of course, that's an additional factor. But we find that uh, I like a, a short, con uh, concentrated spell so that they peak at the right time, not a long, drawn out, you know, what are we doing this afternoon kind of thing. The players you want to work with next summer have got to go through the demands and rigours of a full league season yeah. at a time that you're hoping they're going to be fit and raring to go at the end of that season. So is it a bit of a nail-biter for you, that one? Yeah, it is, because uh, we've always had uh, call-offs. Now, I recall, and I'm sure uh, your listeners or your viewers in England will remember, my first experience with the Scottish team was when I was really privileged. Alec Ferguson phoned me in 1986 
when he was the manager of the national team going to Mexico and he asked me if I would join the, the staff and I thought well that was a great uh, a great thing for me because I was managing a first division team here in Scotland. So it was a terrific accolade for Alec, a man of his stature, to invite me. But I remember then, and it sticks uh, all those years since, you know, we're 12 years on, I remember that unfortunately we'd built our hopes in doing well in Mexico and Kenny Dalglish called off just at the last minute he had an injury and uh, Steve Archibald had been injured most of the previous season at Barcelona but got himself fit and Alec brought Archibald in. But the injury, just what you were saying there, the whole season can have uh, take its toll on players and that happened to Kenny. So our best player, arguably, I think, no, not arguably, definitely our Fantastic best player, player, could not go. Uh, football's been my life for nearly 40 years and the management has been my life for 23 years. So I'm very comfortable in a management context and I think I could manage a team anywhere. Well, Craig, it's been a fantastic Thank achievement. You, Delighted for you. Thank you. That's it for this week. Don't miss next week's show, because we're in a league of our own. <laughs>